Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Ambassador Princeton Lyman, who is the Ralph Bunch Senior Fellow and Director of the African Policy Studies at the Council of Foreign Relations. He served as U.S. Ambassador to Nigeria and South Africa and as Assistant Secretary of State for International Organizations. He's the author of Partner to History, the U.S. Role in South Africa's Transition to Democracy. And most recently, he was with J. Stephen Morrison, Project Director of the Council on Foreign Relations' new report on Africa called More Than Humanitarianism, a Strategic U.S. Approach to Africa. I will show the report and say welcome, Ambassador Lyman, back to Berkeley. Harry, thanks. It's wonderful to be back here. Tell us a little about the origins of this report. How, how did it come about? Well, you know, the Council has two different kinds of programs. They have study programs like mine. We do various reports and meetings, et cetera. And then they have the independent task forces. And um, we had not done in the Council an independent task force report on Africa for a number of years and decided that it was time to do a serious approach to U.S. policy to Africa, not just out of the Africa Studies program, but to bring in people high-level people, well-known people, not always associated with Africa, to take a strategic look at Africa policy. And uh, that's the origin of this report. And, and the, who were the co-chairmen of the report? The co-chairs were Christine Todd Whitman, who is uh, the former d director of the Environmental Protection Agency, former governor of New Jersey, and Anthony Lake, who was the national security advisor to President Clinton. These uh, are generally uh, led by a Republican and a Democrat because the council is uh, very nonpartisan. So from the conception of the idea of doing this, getting the approval, how, 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 how long does it take to, to generate the report and, and what is the process by which ideas are put on the table? This is, has been a 15-month process mm -hmm. from the first approval of the idea the selection of the chairs, then the selection and organization of the people on the task force, and then the organization of the meetings and everything. It's been about 15 months. And, and uh, uh, do you do this through meetings and then uh, we, report, uh, 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 shall we call them sub-reports and so what on? What we did is that we brought the task force together for three meetings that reviewed the issues, reviewed the purposes of the report, et cetera. We then presented at the final meeting a scope paper of how the report might look, got that approved. And then my co-director, Steve Morrison, and I did the drafting and we did through email a constant dialogue back and forth until the report was approved. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's now look at the substance of the report. Why uh, is Africa important and is it important in a new way? Well, that's really the theme of the report, Harry. and that's why the title is More Than Humanitarianism, because there's a tendency to say that our primary interest in Africa is humanitarian, when one looks at the poverty issues, and et cetera, all of which are real. Mm -hmm. But what that does is not give enough attention to the other areas in which Africa is becoming important, and we talk a lot about that in the report. It covers things like energy and terrorism, competition for resources, etc. And what we argue is that should give us a different focus even on the humanitarian interests. Does, does making the strategic argument make it more likely that it will have an impact? 
We hope it does. And one of, the, one of the reactions we got to this approach was people said, oh my gosh, you're going back to the Cold War. It's going to be energy and terrorism and oil, and you're not going to care about the people of Africa. And that's not really the theme of the report. The report is Africa is important, and because it's important, we have greater interests in the development than the human rights and the democracy issues in Africa. And I think as the competition for resources gets keener and keener in the United States, to justify increasing resources toward Africa, which the President pledged and the G8 pledged, there's got to be more than, oh, we feel sorry for Africa. It's got to be an important part of our foreign policy. Uh, one of the themes that runs throughout the report, and, and we're going to talk a little about uh, each of the sections, is that these problems are really interrelated, that, that you, you're suddenly in a section on human rights and, and you need to talk about conflict resolution, and that then leads to a discussion of disease. Uh, talk, talk a little about that. Well, it, it's one of the real challenges because during the preparation of this report, some people said, well, you've got to only focus on three or four problems because that's what a strategy is. And we said, well, that's hard because the problems interrelate. And we're talking about, in sub-Saharan Africa, 48 different countries. But you're exactly right. Poverty and, and conflict are related. Conflict and terrorism and organized criminal gangs are related. Uh, energy, uh, the stealing of oil, is producing uh, armed gangs in the, in the Gulf of Guinea. And HIV AIDS is cutting across all these sectors, having an impact on food, having an impact on, on, the, on conflict, etc. So while we discuss these issues in, in different ways, you have to bring them back together to have a kind of a comprehensive approach that addresses them in an interrelated way. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's talk about some of these problems one by one and, and uh, give uh, our audience both a feel for the problem and, and a feel mm -hmm to the obstacles that lie in the way of solution and, and possible solutions. The, of course, the first thing is, is the health, uh, the public health agenda and, and uh, uh, the problem of AIDS. Why is this such an important topic uh, for anybody looking at the problems of Africa? It's an important topic because HIV AIDS is now a worldwide phenomenon. The epicenter is in Africa. If we, if we don't know and learn how to address it in Africa, we're not going to be very effective, and I say we, the international community, in addressing it as it spreads through China, which is now spreading in India, up through Central Asia and into Russia. But it's also, we're also at a very, very critical time in this pandemic because most of the infections took place in the 90s. And the timeline of this disease is roughly 10 years from infection to full-blown AIDS. Last year, more than 2 million people died of AIDS, but we're at the beginning of a rising death rate. And it's going to have impact not just in the health field, but on the social and economic and political dimensions. And we're running behind the pandemic, even though there's been a lot Lot more resources put into it. We've got to do more if we are going to learn how to contain this here and the lessons that will be learned for the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Now, when, when you have a problem of this magnitude and, and you begin thinking about uh, solutions, you really run into a hornet's nest of issues. For example, is, is the response uh, multilateral or does it come from one or two major powers? Right now, the United States provides roughly half of all the resources going into the HIV AIDS <clears throat> pandemic. The US and the President Bush deserves a lot of credit for his initiative called the President's Emergency Program on AIDS Relief, pledging $15 million over five years. Billion, billion. billion dollars, yeah, sorry, yeah, $15 yeah. billion. Dollars, and that galvanized much more in international attention. Mm -hmm. There is a question of how much should be done bilaterally and how much should be done through this new global fund for HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria. And what the Congress has said is we should do a lot for the global fund but never do more than a third. And that has pushed the Europeans and Japanese and others to, to put more into the global fund. But there, it raises lots of problems of coordination on the ground for countries as to matching these funds and, and addressing how you buy generics or you don't buy generics, et cetera. But it's become, even the Europeans also do a lot of bilateral programs as well as the Global Fund. Mm 
And, and there are also issues of prevention versus treatment that, that really uh, uh, set off a nerve in, in the American debate about right. public policy. And the, and the change that has taken place at the beginning when people were looking at this and there, there weren't the kind of treatments available that there are today, the overwhelming emphasis was on prevention. But treatment has become a human rights issue. And it also relates in part to prevention because you can't get people to come in to be tested if there's nothing you can do for them. So there is a, a, a synergy there. But what the, what the world has done is made this extraordinary commitment first under the president's program and then under the WHO program to say two to three million people will be brought under treatment. But at the G8 meeting last year, there was a pledge to bring everybody in the world who needs treatment mm -hmm. to provide it. This is treatment you have to give for life. Mm -hmm. And most of it's in the very poorest countries. And we're only beginning to realize what that commitment can mean and what it can cost and, and what it takes to do that. So this is, a one of the major areas that we're going to be dealing with for a very long time. Uh, you have a lot of experience as an American ambassador in the aid program and so on, and as, as you reflect back on what the U.S. did in earlier periods, did, did we lay the groundwork for, for coming up with adequate solutions in, in terms of the kinds of aid we gave uh, for health in, in the past? See, one of the problems and, and one of the themes of the report is that if you treat Africa largely as a humanitarian case, you veer off into treating it as a charity. You don't even take account of what Africans themselves are doing, changes going on in Africa, and we talk a lot about that. And the result in the aid program is that while there have been increases in foreign aid to Africa over the last 10 years, about half of it is emergency aid. We respond mm -hmm. to droughts and emergencies. But I'll give you an example of exactly the issue you're talking about. There's a report that's just come out recently from a think tank in Washington called the International Food Policy Research Institute on what it would take to really push food self-sufficiency in Africa. And I read that report. And from my days in AID in the 1970s and 80s, I said, you know, that's what we used to do. But in the 1990s, the World Bank in the United States reduced our aid to agriculture by 90%. So we're in agriculture for a while, then another fad comes along, et cetera. What we're saying in the report is we're serious about this. If this is really important to us, we've got to take a few key sectors and be prepared to stay with them for 10, 20 years with new technology and training. And that we haven't been doing. Mm -hmm. and, and is there a role for the, the private sector, bro, both you know, in the West or other parts of the world, and then the private sector in Africa? I mean, is there a, a synergy that we can find, say, in health that reflects this new synergy that the world is recognizing? Well, one of the changes taking place in Africa is a, a major change in economic policy, away from statist economic policies to opening up for the private sector and, and, and much broader economic openings. It's still very hard. There's still a lot of bureaucratic obstacles to entrepreneurial development. But the private sector is going to be key because Africa isn't going to make it just on foreign aid. In fact, shouldn't make it on foreign aid. It should open up investment opportunities and growth. And in some areas, it's striking. The growth of the cell phone market in Africa is faster than anywhere else in the world. American companies haven't been so heavily involved, but the South African companies mm. are expanding like crazy in places like Nigeria, Kenya, Mozambique, et cetera. So there's these opportunities now for the private sector that are going to be very important. And, and how uh, important uh, and, and what changes have to occur in the African governing classes? AIDS is, is a good example where uh, there was quite a debate in South Africa about the proper course uh, uh, to take and so on. So, so how does that piece fit into this, this problem that is namely convincing the African elites uh, that th this is the way to go? Well, I think it's varied across countries. Again, it's hard to generalize. South Africa, for a lot of reasons that we can go into, uh, was very ambivalent, the leadership, about devoting so much attention to HIV AIDS because Thabo Mbeki felt it was going to take away from 
all his other objectives, mm -hmm. and it, it, it led the government to be very slow in responding. But you have countries like Uganda, uh, Zambia, Senegal, uh, and now Kenya, taking it quite seriously, the leadership of the country making a, a major effort, and we're beginning to see real progress in those countries uh, because the governments take it seriously. But they're a little worried. The international community say you've got to put a lot of people on treatment. They're saying, fine, but are you going to be here five years, 10 years, 15 years from now when these treatment costs are going to be massive for many years to come? Mm -hmm. and, and is there a way to, to make known the implications of the problem on the ground to, to leadership? What, what comes to mind as we're talking is a recent guest here was uh, uh, Sir David King, the science advisor to Tony Blair, and he was talking about uh, the computers empowered uh, uh, the scientific community to be to understand where mad cow disease was mm -hmm, going, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that it became a real political challenge to to make the farmers aware of what the problem right. is. This is this something we have to look for in Africa, not necessarily with computers, but but uh, elevating the consciousness of of the leadership. Are you talking about it in Africa or here? In Africa, well, in, in Africa, Africa yeah, I'm talking about Africa. I think, I think communications in Africa through the internet and elsewhere are having a, a difference. Mm -hmm. uh, the Africa Union, which is a different organization than its predecessor, the Organization of Africa Unity, is bringing countries together around problems that they didn't deal with before. Uh, the Africa Union has created a Peace and Security Council, said conflicts are our responsibility if they're internal or external, and they're sending African peacekeepers into a whole variety of places. So I think, and then you have civil society is flourishing in Africa uh, much more than before, and they're communicating with each other, and that's having an impact. And you see reactions against leaders that try to extend their time in power. You see much more pressure for democratization. Mm -hmm. uh, you see women's group communicating around the continent. So I think this kind of thing is taking place. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's talk then about a second theme that is peacekeeping post-conflict stabilization. You uh, cite a figure in the report, uh, uh, 13 million displaced people in Africa, uh, 3 million refugees. Uh, talking about disease, it, it, the two themes are, are related and so on. Well, conflict is, has been devastating in Africa. It's, mm -hmm. it's caused more death and, 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 and uh, destabilization than any other single thing. The good news is that the number of conflicts in Africa has come down. Major civil wars have been settled. Angola, Mozambique, Liberia, Sierra Leone, the North-South civil war in Sudan. Um, so the number of conflicts has come down. There's been a lot of effort by Africans, by the international community to do that. But you still have severely destabilizing conflicts and threats of conflict. The Congo is the worst because directly or indirectly, four million people have died in that conflict. Now there's elections coming up and hopefully we're gonna get some peace in the Congo. The Darfur situation in Western Sudan, which the United States has declared as a genocide, uh, is, is another such conflict, and the threats of conflict. And bringing those under control takes both African leadership and international support. The Africans have to be there because of the complexities of the conflicts, but they can't do it alone. And it's that combination. And we have a stake in it, because what you see in these conflicts is international criminal activity flourishes, either through capturing natural resources or the accusations that Al-Qaeda used them to refinance through diamonds, et cetera. Uh, and so it impacts on us, as well as having a, a terrible humanitarian impact in Africa. How, how do we work out this division of labor? Because you're, you're making the important point that there has to be a, an African presence. There clearly must be a UN presence to right. bring the international community. And then clearly, if, if one is trying to uh, stabilize the situation or in the conflict, there's a role for the United States, uh, it, not necessarily in terms of troops, but in terms of other technical capacities. Talk a little about the meshing of that and, and, and give us a, a report card grade. I mean, are we getting better at that? Well, I think that there, we, there's a recognition on the one hand that um, 
it's hard to put Western troops into Africa. It happens. We don't do it very much at all in peacekeeping. Uh, other countries do, but not, not for long periods of time. So there's a great emphasis on building up African peacekeeping capability. And that's taking place. But Africans can't afford long-term peacekeeping operations. And we see that in Darfur, Sudan, where the African Union went in, slowly built up to 7,000 reached the limits of their ability, that financing had to come from Europe and the United States. And now it must be supplemented through the United Nations. The African Union went in ahead of the UN in Burundi and in Ivory Coast, et cetera, but then said to the UN, you've got to take it over because we can't sustain it for that long a period of time. The uh, G8 leaders have pledged to build up African peacekeeping over the next five years of capability with equipment and training. That's the kind of mesh that has to take place. In some cases, the Africans will be way out in front. The Africans have really brought the Burundi situation, which could have been a genocide like Rwanda. They reacted a 10-year peace process, their own peacekeepers. They have really saved that situation. In a case like Sudan, you've got to have a lot of international involvement. Mm -hmm. And is is the the streak of uh, unilateralism that, that that we've witnessed in the recent period in American policy? What what problem does that pose, or is it are we able to isolate it, and so that people will respect our multilateral involvement on other issues, where uh, as in in the case of Iraq, there may have been. Uh, a, a dissatisfaction with the unilateralism that was involved? Well, the good thing about Africa policy is that it tends to be less a partisan issue than some of the other areas of U.S. foreign mm -hmm. policy. Most of the initiatives that have been taken on Africa in the last 10 years have been bipartisan. Mm -hmm. The African Growth Opportunity Act, the HIV AIDS emphasis, which had a bipartisan task force in, in Congress to support it. So it's less divisive in that sense, and therefore, some of these ideological battles don't get carried over. Where it has shown up in Africa is two places. The Iraq war has made it difficult to deal with the terrorism issue in Africa because the Africans look at it in terms of what we're doing with Iraq and are we overemphasizing it and are we bringing in something that's not as relevant. The second place is in areas like the Global Fund for HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria, and our bilateral programs. Because now you see our own ideological and cultural wars between abstinence and condoms being carried over into those programs, particularly our bilateral programs. And that does create problems as countries have a multilateral side, but then they have this big bilateral program from the US, which has some of these unilateral characteristics. So, so who carries the load here? Is, is it the work of our ambassadors that become very important in, in moving this agenda of, of, of stabilization and so on forward? In, in, uh, you know, is, is, is that their work, or how, how do you do it? <laughs> that's what good ambassadors <laughs> should do. Yeah. Um, and and it, it is the responsibility of the ambassador to bring these disparate elements of U.S. policy together. And good ambassadors do it well. And under the HIV AIDS program, it's very interesting that they task the ambassador as the key responsible agency, in fact, that HIV AIDS program is in the State Department, not in USAID, mm -hmm. to bring this, these programs together. But then the question is, do the ambassadors have the staff? Do they have the outreach? And we talk a lot about the decline in our diplomatic and intelligence presence in Africa, which makes it harder. I mean, I, I look upon some of my friends and colleagues who are now ambassadors in Africa, and they, didn't, they don't have the resources I had in South Africa, uh, or even when I was in Nigeria, and that makes it much harder. Another problem is, is the problem of trade, because mm -hmm. Africa really has to uh, uh, be brought into the international economy so that, that all boats uh, uh, rise together and so on. W what are we doing there, and what should we be doing? One of the important questions is when we talk about increasing aid, and we had some quite a bit of discussion in the task force about this, and you notice there's a dissent from one of our task force members on the fact that we even supported the increase in foreign aid. He said, no, there's too much foreign aid, mm -hmm. is the, the problem of aid dependency. 
there are good case to be made for age. Jeff Sachs has, has made this case and, and, and others that you can use aid very effectively for important investments. But a lot of countries in Africa already get half their budgets in foreign aid. So the question is, how do you move out of aid dependency? And you do that through real growth and, as you said, integration into the world economy. And then you get to trade. Mm -hmm. And the world trading system is very biased against agricultural producers in the developing world. This is now the major issue in the current round of trade talks. And the African states have come together for the first time, pooled their votes, teamed up with India, Brazil, and others, and said to the United States and Europe, you've got to open these doors to us. The trade subsidy, the agricultural subsidies, the tariffs, et cetera, are keeping us from moving out of aid dependency and into the world market. Now, will all the African countries be able to do it? No. Some are going to have good opportunities, and others are not. But that's a major step toward really putting Africa into the world economy. Mm -hmm. You, you uh, have the figure in the report that the EU and U.S. spend $350 billion for trade protection each year. So In agriculture. In agriculture. And, and that, that the bottom line is their price supports and other uh, tariffs and so on to uh, uh, keep American farmers happy keep our prices lower on the world market, which undercuts the price for Africans, and keeps out imports of agricultural products. And the World Bank finds most of those de trade distorting. We've lost a case in the World Trade Organization on our cotton subsidies. Congress is now faced with trying to get rid of them. But it's a tough domestic issue, as you know, to go to a farm a state senator and say, you know, for the sake of Africa, we have to cut back on these subsidies. And that brings me back to the point is, is Africa important and why is it important? And then we have to say, what do we do about our whole agricultural system that is holding a big part of the world down? Mm -hmm. And here the, the problem is, as you're suggesting, elections, basically, because I, as I, my recollection is that uh, whether it was an agriculture, no, I guess it was steel that the Bush administration imposed uh, tariffs in right. uh, at the time of an election, but it's also a crime that the Europeans are guilty oh, of. That's very more, maybe even more so. worse than us. It's, it's Europe. Europeans. Now yeah. on this one, they are. And, and the U.S. position on this is, we'll move if the Europeans move. Mm -hmm. uh, and the Europeans, this is a very tough issue for the Europeans, France in particular, and some of the other countries in Europe, but they have a, a heavier amount of subsidies than we do. Uh, as an ambassador, you, you have devoted your life to making uh, political groups, working with political groups to make them understand that their ideas uh, don't always go with their actions. Mm -hmm. and, and this is a theme that <laughs> runs through this again and again. I mean, what, what, what do you see, now talking a little about the West, I mean, what, mm -hmm. what do you see uh, as the most compelling way to make the, the, these issues known to the American public, that, that you, you're biting the hand that feeds you in some sense? Or, you well, know. I think there's two things. First of all is to recognize what's happening in Africa, that Africans are working on these issues. Mm -hmm. We talk about, and it's a little unfair to, because they're very good people, but Bono and Bob Geldof Live 8 concert too. Big, big thing last year, focused on ending poverty in Africa. You didn't see a single African on the stage. Mm -hmm. You didn't know that African doctors, nurses, lawyers, statesmen were working on these problems. We have to recognize that we have partners. It's not just charity. Because when it's just charity, people really don't think anything can be done. Mm -hmm. Second, we have to understand that we have a stake in it. And we talk a lot about the energy problem, or the energy issue, that we're already getting 15% of our oil imports from Africa. It'll grow in the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And we know from our relationships to the Middle East, if you don't pay attention to what that means, we pay a price in the long run. And terrorism, it's a, it's a real issue in Africa. So it's important for Americans to say, you know, Africa is important. It may not be as important as Europe, it may not be important as China, but it is important in foreign policy, and therefore we have to allocate it the right amount of attention. Let's take a second to show the report again at the cover. More than humanitarianism, a, strat a strategic U.S. approach toward uh, 
uh, Africa, and I, I believe it's on the Foreign, Council of Foreign Relations website, yes, so people can can download it. And hard copies can be ordered. Okay. Now, uh, uh, as we talk about this trade issue, I, I mean, uh, what you're telling us is that we have to put the, the the, the problem of African trade and its consequences for people in a strategic context. But, but one should emphasize, you say in the report, some 34% of the population in Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, is undernourished, double that the rest of the developing world. Uh, and and uh, we have promised to double aid from 25 to 50 uh, uh, billion in five years. All, we, all, all the G8 uh, countries. Uh, all of the G8 countries. So, so there is an effort underway to recognize the problem, but we always have to think about this long-term solutions versus emergency aid, because you, you get famines, we, we send in the, uh, the, 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 the grain, the food, whatever, and then we pull out. But, but really, these are long-term solutions that, that are required. Right, and, and that's one of the things we talk about. If we're going to increase foreign aid, that's substantially to Africa. Let us make these long-term investments, not go into a sector, then come out of it. Uh, there's a need for a significant investment in new agricultural technologies for Africa. And, and we've got to do that. We've got to build up the scientific capability to do that. And in the health field as well. Uh, and opening up opportunities for the private sector, trade, trade facilitation, and, and infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Infrastructure is very important. UN did a study on, on the landlocked countries of Africa. They said transportation costs are so high for those countries to get to the coast that if the workers work for free, they couldn't compete. Mm -hmm. So there are lots of good long-term investments that can be made, and, 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 that, and we've got to do that. You, you have a statistic in the report uh, where it says uh, that by 2015, 42 percent of sub-Saharan Africa will be under 15 years old. That's so right. so this is a long-term ticking bomb. So right. trade means jobs and investment uh, means jobs, and, and this is a problem you're going to want to address. Uh, the jobs problem is, is I think, uh, underlying one of the most serious ones, and it raises the issue of population. We talk about how population and family planning programs have sort of gone out of favor in the United States for a combination of ideological and political reasons, that's a mistake. Population is growing very rapidly in some of the poorest countries. We have to come back to family planning programs in collaboration with, with, with African countries. And this youth bulge is a potentially destabilizing one. Mm -hmm. Now, in, in the context of your argument and the report's argument about the strategic importance uh, of Africa, energy is a place to look. Why, why is that? Well, in within 10 years, we may be importing as much oil from Africa as we now do from the Middle East. Uh, the, Africa is, is one of the main uh, contributors to the increase in world supply. Big producers like Nigeria and Angola will double their production. For big American oil companies like Chevron Africa, it's their biggest worldwide exposure. ExxonMobil is going to put something like $24 billion into it. And yet, this area, this major producing area, which is the Gulf of Guinea, is one of the most unstable areas of uh, any oil producing area in the world. Because uh, there's a stealing of oil, it's feeding arms groups, there's a lack of capacity in the area to protect the facilities. So what we've said is, look, we've got to be serious about this, we've got to shift attention, there's no real policy attention toward this. We've got to create a U.S. Africa Energy Forum. We've got to work with countries on this. We've got to encourage more transparency in the oil sector so the benefits are going to people. We've got to come in on the security questions of why these armed gangs are getting away with this. Uh, if we've learned anything from the Middle East, we have to care about how the money's used. Mm -hmm. Billions of dollars are going to pour into Africa from energy. We're going to be drawing on that energy, and we need to pay attention to all those implications. So, so in, in the energy field, I, I think you're suggesting, and the report is suggesting that that energy development cannot be isolated from the broader context 
uh, of uh, our, all of our policies in that area and our goals. Because it, if it's one-sided, then you're going to get a one-sided effect in Africa, which will have negative. So in, in, in a funny kind of way, energy policy can't be just left to the energy companies uh, in the same way that a policy in the Middle East can't just be a military solution. Is that, that fair? Uh, no, it's exactly right. And it's important to differentiate. Africa, the energy producing countries in Africa are not going to be big aid recipients. We have to have a different strategy for dealing with countries for which billions of dollars are going to be rolling in in terms of oil revenue. And that takes a different kind of diplomacy and a different kind of interrelationship uh, that, than you would have, let's say, in poor countries that don't have those resources. But uh, it, it's, it's a, you can't look to the oil companies to address all these issues. They're part of it, but it's going to take a lot of government to government work, a lot of government to so civil society work mm -hmm. to do this. And, and in, in all of these issues, getting it right, uh, going back to the strategic question, really relates to the problem of terrorism, which we're so focused on uh, in the Middle East. And, and in the sense, uh, that if, if things go, don't go well in these various areas we've been discussing and the development and the solutions are not kind of broad-based and look at all of the issues, then, then there's, it's a real potential breeding ground for, for terrorism. There's, no, we've already had it. We've already had two American embassies yeah. blown up in 1998, uh, way ahead of 9-11. We know there are cells down the east coast of Africa. We now have a 1,200 person, 1,300 person force, combined joint task force in Djibouti, trying to stem the flow of people and weapons. We know that there are a number of sub-Saharan Africans in the insurgency in Iraq who will be coming back to Africa, trained, etc. We know there are, that terrorists target the Muslim populations and other divisive areas of West West Africa, but you can't just have a military response. Uh, you know, the, the people who have taken this the most seriously have been our European commands and our central command. They're saying Africa is a real mm -hmm. important area, and they've responded. But the, you didn't get the diplomatic oversight, you didn't get the political guidance, you don't get the, the cultural and economic approaches that we need, and if we don't do that, these, these frustrations open up opportunities. It could happen in northern Nigeria, could happen in the Sahelian countries, could happen in, in other countries where there are real issues at stake. And, and you point out that, you, uh, that we have no uh, diplomatic presence in Khartoum or in northern Nigeria. Northern Nigeria is the home to Africa's largest Muslim population, 60 uh, million people, and we have no diplomatic presence on the Mabasa coast where terrorist cells exist. Right. And this is part of this drawdown of American diplomatic and intelligence capabilities during the 90s uh, after the Cold War. And so, you know, I, I get asked a lot. Are, are you saying that al-Qaeda is operative in northern Nigeria? And I say, no, I'm not saying that. But I do say we don't know what's going on in mm -hmm. northern Nigeria mm -hmm. because we have very little outreach, very little contact. And it's not just terror. It's the, the political issues in Nigeria, partly a spillover from the Iraq war, but also the dynamics internally in which the United States is very much a, a target of antagonism in northern Nigeria. And we need that outreach to deal with that and, and have a presence, have people in the embassy who speak the language with we don't. Um, I have talked to friends in the State Department in the Sahelian countries, which border the Sahara Desert, where there's also concern about anti-American and, and terrorist activity. And they don't have the staff to go up into those areas. So we're flying blind in a lot of ways. And you know, then you get a military response, you get the European command coming in, but that can't be the only response we have. Uh, a whole section in the report is devoted to China. Mm -hmm. Why is China important uh, in a, in a, uh, a uh, document that is looking at strategic issues in Africa? Well, one of the points we make in the report is that, China, that Africa is becoming a more competitive arena in the world. There is a 
great demand for natural resources going on, particularly out of Asia, China, India, Malaysia, etc. And that's playing out in Africa, and it has a lot of implications for us, for our policies, as it does for Africans. And we do spend a chapter on this because China comes to Africa with several advantages from the Africans' point of view. They don't put conditions on it relating to governance, human rights, or everything. It's wonderful to hear Marxist Chinese leaders say, when they come to Africa, business is business. We don't, <laughs> you know, we're, we're not interested we, in that. We've come thing. a long way. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and they're doing some good things. Look, it's raised commodity prices for African exports. They're building infrastructure, which we don't do. They're doing some very good things. They're doing some training. But what they are also doing is protecting rogue states in which they have a big interest. Sudan's a classic case. They own 40% of the Sudanese oil industry. They get 7% of their oil imports from Sudan. They sit on the Security Council, and in spite of genocidal acts in Darfur, the Security Council has not been able to put sanctions on the mm -hmm. Khartoum government. They protect a man like Mugabe in Zimbabwe. That raises serious political issues for us. And they're competitors, and their competition has to be met by our companies and, and, and in, in a meaningful way because they come with a lot of cash. Mm -hmm. And they help governments that aren't ready to reform, like Angola, say, you know, we don't need the IMF anymore because the Chinese just gave us $2 billion because they want access to our oil resources. So it's an important new phenomenon. What's interesting is we have gotten more press attention on that particular mm. section of the report than any other part of the report. And, and what was the nature of the response? I mean, the, the fact that you were making uh, China so important in this equation, or what? Well, it was from the Africans, it was, aha, you've noticed. Mm -hmm. um, get on a plane in Africa, you'll see Chinese business. But there are 68,000 Chinese workers in Africa. Mm -hmm. They also bring their own workers. But the reaction from China has been interesting because China did not dialogue on these issues before. Uh, now we are opening up a dialogue. Uh, our Assistant Secretary of State uh, for Africa, Jendaya Fraser, has just come back from Beijing. Chinese issued a policy paper on their policies in Africa. And when they issued it, what did the press ask him about? They asked him about the issues that we raised in our report. Mm. So the Chinese have now come back to us and said, we'd like to meet with you at the, Security, at the Council on Foreign Relations to talk about our policy in mm -hmm. Africa. And what we've said in the report is, look, let's not make this Cold War adversary issue. We need to talk about the real issues between us, but also to see where there's common ground. China should have an interest in stability in the Gulf of Guinea areas and in other areas. Let's talk about Sudan and Darfur. Um, China has kind of two sides to its public image. One is, we are part of the third world, we're a developing country, we're a leader of the developing countries, but they're also a superpower. They want to be a, a, a seen as a major power, and that means responsibilities. So the dialogue becomes very important on these so, issues. So it's, it's a real challenge in, in the global arena today, when you focus on a problem like Africa, to help uh, influence the Chinese in whether they go for a narrow national interest right. in their dealings with Africa or become part of a, a kind of a multilateral solution. Right. And in some ways they are. They put peacekeepers into Africa. They joined the UN peacekeepers. They're working in health. But in other areas, they're not helpful. Uh, and I think that's exactly the kind of dialogue we need to have and to recognize that there's now going to be significant players uh, in Africa. And the Indians are coming along very rapidly behind them with the same approaches. Malaysia, even South Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, this makes the, the arena more competitive. Mm -hmm. One of the most important challenges in a document like it, uh, this, I guess, is uh, addressing the American institutions and the American constituencies. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what do you hope to re achieve with this report uh, with regard to elevating American consciousness? Well, it's interesting, Harry, that, that there has been a growing number of constituencies concerned with Africa, and, and we, th we see this as an important strength. I mentioned before that Africa isn't a, a partisan dividing issue, which is important. You have a tremendous growth within the religious communities 
focused on Africa, the evangelical community, which played a big role in getting the Bush administration to focus heavily on the Sudan Civil War, which was a Muslim Christian kind of conflict. But then they've turned their attention to HIV AIDS and was, were, have been a major influence in having more done on that. And then you have the religious groups that worked on debt relief, the Jubilee 2000, which has resulted in more debt relief. You have a large involvement now of the public health community across the United States mm. in not just HIV AIDS, but TB and malaria. And so with these growing constituencies, along with the more traditional constituencies for Africa, the African American community, which has been active, and other religious groups and NGOs, what we're hoping is that they will come together, not see that when we say more than humanitarianism, that we're playing down the importance of the humanitarian issues, but that seeing them in this broader context is a basis for getting a better Africa policy. Mm -hmm. what, what about the argument that in, in the present environment, the, the US government were to read this report and believe it is not uh, is losing the capacity to come up with a coherent strategy. Uh, in the report, you point out that there are three military commands that deal with Africa. If you're talking about uh, energy policy, you know, you're, you're talking about bringing in all sorts of uh, parts of the federal government mm -hmm. and so on. It is a challenge, and, and one of the ironies of this administration is that they've created more uh, different entities to give foreign aid than we had ever had before. They created the Millennium Challenge Account, which is separate from AID. They created the AIDS relief and put it in the State Department. And now you see the Secretary of State, Condoleezza Rice, saying, wait a minute, I, I can't coordinate these things and she's now created a new position for the head of AID to be a kind of coordinator of foreign assistance to try and get some cohesion. Mm -hmm. I think and in, in, in the only way you can do this is to give real authority to people working on Africa and say look you have the backing of the president and the secretary of state to pull in the people necessary to 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 get people working together around these problems i've been in the government long enough or was to formal reorganizations are not the answer mm -hmm. but you can create cohesion of different entities and agencies around a problem when the senior people in the administration from the president on down say this is important and I want it done and this is my person whether it's the assistant secretary for Africa or the NSC advisor on Africa they're speaking for me and we want it done and then you get the kind of cooperation necessary and if we get that then the secretary of state doesn't have to do everything mm -hmm. but she can make sure it's being done how, how do you deal then with the problem of the overemphasis on one region and one part of the world? In, at the height of the Cold War, when we had a lot more resources, where we weren't uh, challenged by mm -hmm. uh, as many other actors such as China and, you know, and India, it was able to, we were able to focus on the Middle East, on Asia, think about Africa. But, but now we seem to have gone in a, in a uni-regional uh, direction. So how do we write that balance? Is, is this report part of that? Well, I, I hope it helps in this regard. And of course, we're having conversations with the administration on the report and with Congress. I'm very happy to say that it's, it's uh, uh, two of the senators who lead the uh, Africa subcommittee in the Senate, Senators Martinez and Feingold, have sent this report under a personal letter to 75 other senators and said this is an important report. Um, it's, it's going to be hard and I think it's going to be a tough battle for resources. The president says we're going to double aid to Africa, but I think that's going to be very tough to do. Mm -hmm. um, but when the Secretary of State talked recently about transformational diplomacy, moving away from some of the focus in just some regions and not in others, and shifting resources, including Africa, mm -hmm. It was, in our view, a step in, in the direction. I also have a feeling that there is sympathy in the administration and, and in parts of Congress to say we do have to look at Africa strategically, not just as, like a, as a charity case. We do have a lot of interests there. They may not take the place of our interests in the Middle East or someplace like that, but they are important. They have to be done. 
and you allocate within reason responsibilities. We say, if you're really going to increase aid to Africa that much, or even half that much, think about how we're going to use those resources mm -hmm. uh, strategically, rather than just doing it in response to emergencies, et cetera. You, 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 the report really seems to be suggesting that, look, we've got to focus on these problems now so that we don't have to turn to a military solution right. uh, in, in, in some you know, long-term response because that won't solve the problem in any way, really. That's right. Look at the, the situation in the Delta region of Nigeria, one of the big oil-producing areas, which has for a combination of neglect, environmental damage, discrimination, et cetera, deteriorated from a, a deep environmental social problem into now one where there's an armed insurgency, criminal gangs, and corruption at a, at a major scale, which is creating a whole new dimension of security problems. That could get worse and really disrupt the supply of energy out of, out of West Africa. Y you want to get in on those problems before they deteriorate to that level or deteriorate worse. Our program will be watched by a general audience and also by students, so I, so I have two final questions for you. Mm -hmm. One is, how can a general audience make a difference, you know, beyond obviously reading this report? Two ways. I think um, there are a lot of opportunities to be involved through a lot of organizations. Some are advocacy organizations, some are religious organizations, some are NGOs, to be involved in programs related to Africa. And they're not just charity programs. These are programs that really are building capacity, supporting women in, in Africa who are really, some of the women in Africa are phenomenal in the peace process and in the political process. It's a wonderful organization called Women Waging Peace. And there are lots of organizations that people can get involved in. But it's also communicating with our leaders in Congress and saying, you know, we, we think Africa is important. Uh, when they come home. I've talked to congressmen about issues like this and they say, I agree with you, when I go home nobody ever asks me about them. Mm -hmm. So that's important. For the students, there's a, quite a movement across the country on the Save Darfur Coalition, which is very strong, grew out of the students, and now is playing out across the country and it's having an impact. And I know more students are studying African affairs. I teach a course on Africa at Georgetown and it's full. Uh, and some of my colleagues around the country who teach courses on Africa are finding a growing interest among students. And I think that's a very healthy thing. Uh, Ambassador uh, Lyman, let me show you your report again. And again, it can be downloaded uh, from the Council on Foreign uh, Relations uh, website. Uh, I want to thank you very much for, for doing the report, coming back as a former graduate of Berkeley to be on our program today and, and, and really helping us think about these uh, very important issues. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you, Her. Thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.